Hi, everyone. I am so dang excited to be talking to the amazing Susan Orling, who wrote this tremendously fun, interesting, insightful book called On Animals. We're going to talk about that book today for the next 30 or 40 minutes. Susan, hello. How are you, my dear? I'm great. I'm really good. And I'm so happy to be here. I really am. I, I was debating whether to let my dog sit in my office with me while I was doing this because it seemed appropriate, except they've <laughs> been wild today. Absolutely wild. So they're in the house. You know, it's so funny that you should mention that because my main preparation for this conversation was figuring out what to do with my animals. I have three cats and two dogs. And as you well know, anytime you try to do something like some, they're always intervening. Right. And so right. I, I had to coordinate letting them in and out. And if a cat wanders by in front of the screen, you know, I think that will just add to the experience. Right. Exactly. Um, the problem is that cat, my cat likes to sit on my keyboard and right. the results are unpredictable. So, <laughs> I mean, well, maybe I'll have to write our next book, Susan. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? It'd be so much then, easier. Oh, so so how, many, much easier. how many animals do you have right now living with okay. you? Right now, I have a rather paltry number. I have two dogs and a cat. And that, that's probably slightly higher than the national average, but I have an 11 year old Welsh Springer Spaniel who. I adore. Um, I have a pandemic puppy, a smooth fox terrier, um, because I was struck like everybody else in this great land of ours. Midway through COVID, I had learned how to bake bread. I had learned how to make yogurt. And then it was, we need another puppy. <laughs> uh, and then, and I have a cat who is um, also around 11 years old. Wow. So yeah, I, I made it out without a pandemic puppy, but I did get a pandemic kitten because we only had two cats and what kind of crazy person only has two cats when you really need three. Yeah. yeah. So well, like that. I had three for a while. And then when we moved to LA, we left one of the cats in New York because she was really an outdoor cat. And in LA, you really can't be an outdoor cat right. or you, you can be a, an outdoor cat for a very short amount of time and then you get eaten. Then the coyote. Um, right, so we, we ended up, we brought two cats, the two who we thought could tolerate living inside and then one of them who was very ancient um, had passed away and we mm -hmm. haven't gotten more cats. So we have one sorry. cat who thinks he's a dog. Yes, so. that, I, right. I love how, you know, here we are. I in, I started off this conversation telling all of you fabulous people out there watching us that we're going to talk about your new book, Susan, and we are hijacked by our animals, which is what in part makes this book so, I mean, I read it in one sitting. I was on an airplane. I just couldn't stop reading it. And your writing is always that way to me, Susan. I so admire your craft and just the, you know, your personality on the page is always compelling, but there's something about animals, right? That really compels us. And so I'm curious, could you please tell us what, why did you decide to, to put this collection of essays together? What, what's the Genesis story of this book on animals? Well, two things, and they're both in an odd way, sort of COVID related. And one is to go back to what I just mentioned, getting a puppy and thinking about why was it that everybody had this impulse right. during COVID to get a dog? What is it that felt so comforting and grounding and elemental about having a pet that we were all sort of gravitating toward it? And secondly, I think um, I, like probably a lot of us during this time, did a lot of reflecting on what was important in my life, what I had done, what I hoped to do. I mean, it was a very meditative sort of time when you're faced with this catastrophe. I was looking back over my professional life and I thought it's so interesting that I keep revisiting this subject 
And then it very naturally seemed like it, it just suited the, the kind of parameters of a collection. I mean, once I pulled the stories out, I thought, wow, these, these actually each fit together in a way that will sort of expand on the purpose of each story. So it came together very naturally once it dawned on me. Mm -hmm. And it's titled On Animals. I, I'm always fascinated by that word, animals, because, and I'm sure you thought about this too, as, as writers, we know how inexact, <laughs> at least our interpretation of the meaning of that word is, because of course, what we mean is non-human animals, but we humans are also right. animals. And it's fascinating to me. I, I'd love for you to share your thoughts about that. This, this thing that we do, that even with the language, we don't say non-human animals, we say animals, and we all know exactly what we mean by that. And in a, in a lot of ways, what that does is it erases our animalness, our animal nature. And it and it really puts up, a, I think, a divide between us and all the other species of animals that probably really isn't there. Right, I mean, it's a very artificial division. And of course, part of the irony of the title is intentional, which oh. is these stories, I'm not a naturalist. I didn't go into the bush and follow uh, a wildebeest for a year and record its natural behavior. These stories all, to a greater or lesser degree, are about this interface between the human animal and the non-human animal. And, you know, in this world, it, sadly, there's not a lot of pure wildness mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. And there, there aren't that many opportunities to observe or to write about an animal that's really unaffected by human civilization. I'm not sure that such a thing exists at this point. And these stories certainly very intentionally were about the humans interacting. And it's probably the case that they are in a sense more revealing about the individual characters of the people mm -hmm. in the stories than of the animals themselves. And that's because animals um, have the good fortune of being relatively inscrutable, that we, we can project on them, we can try to understand them. But, you know, one of their superpowers is that they remain opaque to us by and large, and that we can do whatever we can do to try to understand them, but they'll never really give away who they are to us, um, which I I think is actually kind of wonderful. Yeah. Um, we'll never really, I mean, here's a fact that I didn't have in the book, but I absolutely loved it, which is scientists don't even know if whales sleep. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know that much about whales and we don't even know something as basic. I mean, they probably sleep, most animals sleep, but we don't know that for a fact. And the idea that animals still keep their secrets is kind of, I think, sort of wonderful. To it's pretty imagine. magic. Yeah. One of my favorite moments in the book is the, the chapter or the essay that you wrote about this this champion show dog biff and you know you have written many profiles of people over the years and here you've been given this task right of writing a profile of biff and so you're determined to sort of do do the you know due diligence as a journalist you would never write a profile about a human animal without spending time alone with that human and so you at one point say i want to spend time alone with Biff. Can you tell us about what happened? <laughs> well, this was actually really funny and I have to make fun of myself because, you know, as you say, as a journalist, if you're profiling a celebrity, the one thing you really want and, and actually generally insist on is that you get a little bit of time where their manager and their agent and their makeup artist and all of the people who surround them and, and fluff them and 
polish them for you, fall away, and that you have a little bit of time, just you and that celebrity. And I was very insistent on this with, with Biff. And I said to his handler and his owners, look, I really need time alone with him. And, you know, I was sort of in my righteous journalist mode. And they said, well, you know, all right, I guess so. And they said, why don't you go visit him when he's at his handler's house? He jogs regularly to stay in shape, um, as one does. And he worries about his weight as a celebrity might. Um, and to or at least know his human animals for him. Yes, human animals. He exactly. absolutely worries about his life. Exactly. <laughs> and so his handler said to me, all right, why don't you spend your time alone with him while he's jogging? And I thought, oh, good. That's perfect. So she put him on his jog, um, his treadmill and left the room. I mean, giving me a look like, I don't know what you think you're doing. And I sat there with him just me and Biff. And then I kind of had this moment of thinking, well, he doesn't talk. That this great moment of intimacy where I was really going to get to know him would come to naught. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was, um, I have to say I included it in the story because I was sort of making fun of myself and of the conventions of a typical celebrity profile because there is always that moment and I've done a million celebrity profiles. There's always the moment that you like to say, and we were alone, it was me and Tom yeah. Hanks and not his manager and not his agent. And we really got close and we really got to know each other as people. Yeah. You know, and this is very much something that you do as a job. Yeah. So, so it was me and Biff and we got to know each other. Well, you know, Susan, I hate to, I mean, I know we, you can't go back in time, but as I'm listening to this story, I'm realizing your mistake was that you sat there and watched him run on that treadmill. You should have gone for a jog with him. The two of oh, you. Oh, you know. It would have been so much more revealed. But here's the thing. It's, it's kind of interesting what you're saying about how animals are inscrutable. And yet what we know, like, you know, when you, I, I can't remember if you said your dog was like a cat or your cat was like a dog. When, when you know an animal, when you, when you actually love an animal or live with an animal or work with an animal, you come to know them in a very specific and particular way. You come up, you come up with a, at least some form of a language to communicate with them. And it, it, it really is a fast, like, for example, you write about having chickens. I grew up in the country. I had chickens as well. And, you know, you think like chickens are this just great mass of whatever. The chickens are all one thing. And then you have four chickens like you did. And those four chickens each have personalities. They're each right. individuals. And you communicate with them in different ways. So there is this, you're right, absolutely, they're inscrutable. And there are so many things I wish I could know about my cats and dogs and what's in their minds but there are a lot of things I do know. And I think that that's maybe part of what compels us so much about animals, right? That we're, yes. we're in so many ways trying to teach them our language and, and learn their own as well. Yes, I, I think that that is where the fascination comes from, that there, there is a, a way that the animal world is both familiar to us and inscrutable. If, if they were utterly incomprehensible, I don't think we would be as interested. I think the fact that we can witness love and fear and desire, you know, we can see those very easily in animals and not just dogs and cats, but even as you go lower down, definitely chickens, all of the animals I've ever had, I could discern emotions and reactions that I recognize mm -hmm. and and yet they there is a a barrier you know the thing I can I compare it to the most is the idea that if Martians uh, landed on earth mm -hmm. and that you knew they had 
their own customs and their own language that you didn't have. But you, you could understand a certain component of their behavior. And it's much more interesting than, than an, a life form that has no relation to us. I mean, we're animals. Right. We're animals. So it's not that animals are imitating our behavior. It's that we're all part of the same life form that has diverged in many ways. But we still recognize that that, that component is there. And it's, it's sort of a profound connection. It is. I, have you, so I want to talk in a minute about this. You know, we think of animals very often. There's wild animals and domesticated animals. And then there's this, this middle ground of animals. You write about several of them in your book um, where they're wild, but domesticated or contained in some way. You know, they're Keiko, Kiko, is it Keiko? Keiko. Keiko, yeah. the whale and, you know, li lions that had been used in a pet petting zoo as cubs or tigers that are kept in New Jersey by, you know, a woman who keeps tigers in New Jersey. And th those animals, I think, really, you know, obviously capture our interest and probably no in no greater way than like w when you wrote about Keiko and how, you know, millions upon millions of dollars were spent to save this whale from captivity. He was living in this kind of grim place in Mexico on display and the, the, the movement um, after he was featured in this film, Free Willy, was to set him free in the wild. I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And here again, you know, the animal story is that he, right, he was successfully released into the wild, or at least as far as we know, successfully. Um, actually, sadly, he was not. Um, and, and the saga, he, at the time I finished the story, he was on his own. And he came, then he came back. And oh, he, he did. Started, he came back to wow. Iceland to be with his keepers and to be fed and to be cared wow. for. Um, I do think, and many of the stories in the book are about this liminal space when a wild animal has come into our universe. And I will say it's never willingly. Um, right. you know, these are animals that for their misfortune have ended up in the human world. What happens to them? How do we manage that? Um, you know, is this something that we want to do going forward? The more we learn about animals and, you know, a lot of what I learned was pretty sobering. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, this story about the uh, lion whisperer in South Africa, who is, is this guy who has a very intimate relationship with these lions. And the lions were bred to be um, used in these petting zoos where, you know, you can pet a lion cub. They're mm -hmm. pretty docile for about six months and then they are not. <laughs> Right. And well, then they're you, like 100 pounds or 200 pounds, right? Yeah. yeah. And they could hurt you and they don't want to be petted anymore. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and any of us, and I'm guilty as charged, I was at a county fair and they had a lion cub and you could pay $10 to play with the lion cub. Well, it's hard to resist. Who doesn't want to touch a lion cub? Yeah. How old I, were you when you did that? Um... Oh, this is probably 20 years ago, so I was an adult. Oh, yeah. But but I thought, oh my God, a lion cub. That's amazing. And I go to petting zoos and like I like to pet the goats and the chickens. And right. This right. was a, you know, a surprise that there was also a lion. And I didn't understand the implications of that decision and, right. and the fact that you know, if you begin to play out this scenario, what happens when this line gets a little older and is too big and too dangerous to be at a county fair? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't like to think about 
that you think about the moment and the thrill of touching a lion. Right. So that was an education for me. And it was something that I was glad that I could highlight in the book. You know, so, I mean, we have a moral um, obligation as the alpha predators on earth um, to think about what it means when we interact with animals that are wild and what the outcome is or the best case scenario outcome, which as the Keiko story revealed, even the very best intentions, millions of dollars, yeah. you know, dozens of, of people devoted to the cause, that doesn't solve the problem that an animal that is captive from the time of its birth loses a lot of instincts about how to be wild. And Keiko really liked hanging out with people. Yeah. He and it liked. becomes so complex. I think sometimes too, obviously in Keiko's case or any kind of show animal like that, you know, people are trying to profit off of them as a perform a, a performer but you know even the, even the kind of most banal impulse like you said like who's, who doesn't want to pet a lion cub or or feeding frankly wild animals i grew up in northern minnesota and at jack shack which was you know the the, the seven the bar seven miles from my house a little bar restaurant you know there would be uh there was an old trough out back and they would put the food scraps out there because the bears would come and and eat them and you could sit and have your your dinner and look out the windows at these bears you know 10 or 12 feet away from the window oh, God. and you know it's like no harm done we're doing a nice thing right feeding the bears doing a really not nice thing right we're habituating them but it's what's interesting to me i've always been you know and i'm a big advocate of like don't feed the wild animals you know let them be wild um but what you're we're trying to tell people like in some in some ways like go against the the impulse of what we think is kindness like feeding, right. you know intervening in in some way what well, are, you know, can you tell us um what experience have you had any profound experiences with wild a wild animal uh where i actually interacted with a, an animal in the wild yeah and, and in the wild wild i mean what what kind of interact how often have you interact you know interacted with animals in the wild and tell us a story about one you know i that's a great question and i would say that my experiences have been fairly limited. Um, I haven't, and I've always dreamed that I would go hiking and a bear and I would square off and look at each other and have a moment of understanding and each go off in our own way. I haven't, ha I mean, and I've spent a lot of time camping and being in the woods. My encounters with wild animals have mostly been mediated very much by the animal encroaching into human space. I mean, I was staying in a house in Aspen and a bear broke in and ransacked the kitchen. So wow. I would say, yeah, this was an encounter with a bear, but not exactly the pristine, magical experience that I wanted to have with a bear where we would be in the wild. Um, a mountain lion has been um, coming into my yard. And, you know, this isn't where I'd really like to see a mountain lion. I mean, I feel the mountain lion is perfectly entitled to be here, but he, he would easily eat my cat and my dog and me for that matter. So it's not the, I mean, I've seen, I saw a lot of whales when I was in Norway mm -hmm. and Iceland and places where people generally don't go. And it felt very much like I was in the animal's world rather than they were in my world. And I love that. Yeah. I well, love just, that feeling. Just when you said a mountain lion has been coming into my yard, um, that's so much about perspective. The mountain, you came into the mountain lion's yard. Right. 
I mean, yes. it's else in the mountains, yes. right? No, exactly. I feel like saying, look, I totally get it. <laughs> this is your, you know, we've got a problem here, which is that this was your, and, you know, it's very interesting when I moved to L.A., um, the, the presence of wild animals is so evident because L.A., lays a little more lightly on the land than a place like Manhattan where, you know, it's dense and completely concrete, mm -hmm. you know, LA, there's still a lot of green space. There are deer that I live in the city and yet there's a lot of wilderness very nearby. Right. So there are a lot of wild animals that have somehow Ad adapted more or less to the presence of, of people. And, and so that isn't the dream experience of seeing an animal in the wild. I think what is my, and even in South Africa where I saw um, giraffes and, you know, big game, mm -hmm. that was extraordinary, but there was a little sort of tinge of sadness for me when I realized that this isn't real wilderness, that, that South Africa is, you know, the wildlife is very managed and it kind of has to be for its own health, but it, it isn't the wild. Um, mm -hmm. It's a different mediated version of wilderness that, you know, as human beings have flourished on earth, um, right. we, we've left our fingerprints pretty much everywhere. Yeah. I mean, and I, I love, I'm going to get to, I see that we have a couple of questions from people watching us and I want to say, you know, I love the, there's, there's so much about this book. Like I said, that's just like so many great stories about animals and there's, I feel like a sense of, joy and kind of permeates the book, but there is also, you know, there is a sad thread that runs through a lot of these stories when it, when we talk about the, the ways that humans have impacted the lives of non-human animals. And I remember um, several years ago, I was at a dinner, a fundraising dinner for, for a, an, an animal conservation organization. And I was sitting next to a scientist and he said to me, um, your, your polar bears are going to be extinct, um, you know, within the next century. And he just said it was such crushing certainty that I, I was just devastated. And I think that this, you know, the, the really important questions that your book really asks and, you know, I think if you at the core is like, you know, how do we, how do we live with animals better? You know, is right. there because we have harmed them. You know, we think about those, the bears in the woods and the snakes, and we, we think about the ways that they might potentially harm us, which are actually incredibly rare. But what's really true are the ways that we've harmed them. Right, and, and it goes so much to these moral questions and, and also these really important questions about habitat, about, um, the meaning and necessity for captivity, is that something we really need in a world in which we can have extraordinary visual documentation of wild animals in the wild? Um, but the, there's no doubt that um, the subject of animals, while it's full of delight, um, there's also, we're never very far from that other beat of some wistfulness and melancholy mm -hmm. uh, about the complexity of, of living on earth with these other species and we dominate them. I mean, there, there's no question. And what comes with that morally and ethically? So here's a question from Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Which is actually two questions. What was your favorite of the chapters or essays to write? And, and what was um, the hardest one to write? Well, my favorite to write probably was the story about uh, donkeys in 
Morocco because I just love donkeys <laughs> and um, the chance to see them as this vital cog in the the machinery of a place and they weren't quaint they weren't being kept just as pets but they were they were part of the fabric of the city and i i just loved seeing that and and honestly i just loved being around so many donkeys so that was just pure pleasure for me um which was the hardest to write Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, the Keiko story was very challenging because it had so many chapters. I mean, it was it was a really complicated story that um, just took a lot of reporting and a lot of um, storytelling. So that that was probably the biggest challenge in in as a writer. Mm -hmm. So we're going to wrap up very soon here. So if somebody has a burning question, please ask it in the next couple of minutes. You can put it in the chat and it will be passed on to me. Um, here's one from Nancy. When you write, does it generally float easily for you? I hope your answer to that is no, Susan. Um, yeah. <laughs> just a little side note. It better not float easily, sister. Um, it always reads like it does, but I'm curious how much revising and hesitating you do. This is my favorite writer question because it's like, Oh my gosh, at least for me, it's hard as hell. And then, but the job is to make it seem like, yeah, this just right. Me up, right? Right. Well, I guess in a way it's like a magic trick. I mean, yeah. I assume magicians have to practice endlessly and, and they blow it a million times. And then when they do it, it, it looks so effortless that you are completely beguiled. Yeah. Um, I write from the beginning to the end. So my giant challenge, of course, is is getting my lead down. And I do two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. Two step forwards, one step back. I revise repeatedly as I go along. And if the outcome is that it feels like it flows, then I've, I've really succeeded. Um, I, that's, of course, what I want. I, I want that illusion. And I'm not a tortured writer, but I, I am, I'm a fuss budget and I feel like every single word has to be the one that I want. Um, so that my progress can seem at times just glacial. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem like it to us. Um, so we're going to close pretty soon here, but I wanted to, um, share a story with you and ask you about your own relationship to the animals who you love the most profoundly and deeply in your life. I wrote about this experience in, in wild. Um, when my mom died, she died young of cancer in the last couple of days of her life, she was in a delirium. And what she talked about in those two days, was the animal she loved because she believed they were in the room with her. She believed that the cats and the dogs were sitting all over her bed, that there was a horse in her room. And what was so amazing to me is how, how deeply comforting I found that because I knew she loved those animals. And so she was with, at least she believed herself to be with these beings that were so profoundly important to her, made her feel loved. They guided her out of this life. And I'm curious about your own profound love for the animals in, in your life. Tell us about the animals you've loved the most deeply. And if they're with you still, if you, if you feel like that they're, you know, in some ways your companions. I feel like the most fortunate aspect of the human character is our ability to love animals because it's a, such a, a pure and comforting and satisfying relationship. I mean, obviously our relationships with our, with people are, are wonderful and they're complex and they're, they're nourishing, but they're complicated and they're, they're not always so, so um, unilateral. Mm -hmm. And the feelings that 
I've had toward my pets. And when I think about it, I think about the first dog that I ever got, who's my own dog, not, not when I was a child, but foolishly, I got a dog when I was in college and she lived to be 13 years old. And so she, I met her when I was in college. I had her when I got married. I had her when I moved multiple times and I felt that she knew my secrets, mm -hmm. but in the way that made me happy, not um, the way with a person in a dark moment, you might think, oh my God, they know all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> but instead it was this feeling that she knew me, she knew everything about me and that she would always be on my side and, and, and always be there for me in just some pure way. And I know that seems like, well, you know, we all have that impulse towards our pets, but it's, it's real. It, it, it is real. It's not, it's not for nothing that people have been keeping pets for millennia, mm -hmm. that, that, that there is a, a form of love that we feel for them and that they demonstrate to us that's really nourishing and and satisfying. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't ever walk away from your dog feeling like, huh, that was not a satisfying experience. <laughs> it's always joyful. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think it's really, a lot of people, you know, really feel, I certainly feel this way about my animals that, you know, this, that, that there's that somehow that love gets diminished because it's between a human and a non-human animal, but it's just as important. Like you say, a lot less complicated, which in some ways makes it more beautiful <laughs> because it's like, you, you know, you know, this animal has your back that, you know, that dog that grew up with you through your twenties and into your thirties, you know, that's, that's, that is somebody who not only knows your secrets, but who will, who will carry them with love, you know, it's powerful. Right. Stuff. right. And I mean, we we're so lucky to have those relationships. Yeah. They, they are um, almost without fail, uh, a kind of feature of, of daily life that always, makes me really happy. Me too. Well, I have had such a lovely time talking to you. And I, I know your literati book club read your, read this book this month. I hope they're all listening right now. And, and um, I hope that uh, you have a really fun time sharing this book with the world. I was thinking about that, Susan you must get to hear so many great, lovely animal stories because we all have so I many do. of them. I do. And I do feel like it's this, I'm tapping into this well of feelings and stories and um, it, yeah. it's great. It's absolutely great. Well, thank you for taking the time to, to chat with me about your beautiful book and I'm wishing you all the best and 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 all the best to all your, to your animals keep them away from the mountain lion in your yard that's my advice yes absolutely <laughs> no kidding and thank you everyone uh from literati who's all of my club members who've joined us other folks who've who've joined us this has really been a treat yes all right thank you susan thanks. and thanks to all of you for joining us